At this time, uh, I'd like to introduce our speaker, Mr. Michael Brewer of Brewer and Shipley, and he lives in the Ozarks and contributes a lot to uh, our music scene, so we appreciate him. Come on up. Hey, Lord. How are you doing? I hear you're being sick. Get well. Well, thanks for uh, coming, and thanks, Chris, for inviting me. Uh, I sang on the radio when I was four years old, and I'll be 72 next month, so I only have 25 minutes. I guess I better get, get started. <laughs> I was born and raised in Oklahoma City into a musical family, and uh, I'm the oldest of four kids. We were all musical. Our parents were musical. Our mom taught music out of the home, so we all grew up playing some piano and learning a little bit about music. <clears throat> but actually, any instrument that any of us showed in, uh, interest in, if we were serious about it, our parents made sure that we, we had one. And so there was a lot of music being played in our home growing up every day. And as I said, I sang on the radio when I was four years old. Might have been six, but it was too long ago to remember, so it was a long time ago. Anyway, I've always been on stage. Uh, I was probably the perfect age for original rock and roll, 12 or 13 years old. And everything went from uh, Patti Page and uh, Perry Como and Vic Damone to Little Richard and Chuck Berry and Elvis and Gene Vincent and, you know, on and on and on. Changed my world. A couple of years into high school, I got into the drums, and I became a singing drummer in a rock and roll band with uh, Jesse Ed Davis on guitar. Jesse went on to play with everybody from Dylan to the Beatles until he sadly OD'd in the 80s. Uh, a little later into high school, folk music came along, and it really changed my world. Sold my drums, got a brand new Martin D18 guitar, and started learning chords and folk songs. And there was a whole circuit of folk rooms all across the United States at that time. And Oklahoma City happened to have one on the circuit called the Boot Eye. And because of that place, I got turned on to artists and music I never would have known existed. And eventually, I got to be the kind of the house opening act for many of the artists traveling the circuit, playing, playing uh, the folk circuit. Uh, but first, I had to get good enough for that, and that's where the Webb Coffee House came into play. It was operated by a man named Penfield Cowan, and he let me get on stage anytime I wanted to. Eventually, he even paid me five bucks. So I was a professional, professional folk singer. And uh, several years ago, rest his soul, Penn gave me a gift, and it's one of my prized possessions. This stool <coughs> was very old. It could go on Antiques Roadshow. It's, uh, it was very old the first time I saw it, much less sat on it. But uh, what makes it so special to me is that this is the stool from the Webb Coffee House stage, the very first folk room I ever played. The derrieres of Joan Baez and Judy Collins and, and uh, Burl Ives and Janis Joplin have sat on this stool along with my skinny ass and a lot of other people's butts too. Um, about a year out of high school, I started traveling the folk circuit all over the country, playing more and more clubs and meeting lots of people. I met Tom Shipley at a folk room in Kent, Ohio. <clears throat> Excuse me. First time I met David Crosby was in a folk room in Omaha, Nebraska. Somewhere uh, in my boxes of old stuff, I have a Polaroid snapshot of Paul Kantner, rest his soul. He just died recently. If you don't know who Paul was, he was a founding member of Jefferson Airplane, Jefferson Starship. Anyway, I have an old photograph of him in uh, Van uh, Venice Beach, California, ironing clothes, wearing uh, a white button-down collar shirt and horn rim glasses and a flat top haircut when he was a banjo player in a, in a folk group, <laughs> along with uh, Yorma Kalkinen, as a matter of fact. Met a lot of people. Uh, the Beatles came along and uh, were changing the world, <laughs> the whole world. Dylan had plugged in and uh, was continuing to, to change the world. A lot of folk artists were were uh, starting to write their own songs and thinking about uh, plugging in. It was the beginning of folk rock. I was talking about meeting David Crosby. He was at least influenced as much as I was and a lot of other people by a guy named Fred Neal. Fred Neal is most known for writing the song Everybody's Talking, 
but uh, he wrote a whole lot of other songs, made some great records, and he, he was sort of the cow catcher on the train of folk rock, I think. He was one of the founding fathers of that. I met two other guys in Ohio, Tom Maston and Dave McIntosh, and we did some hanging out, did some picking, wrote a couple of songs, and we decided to go to California. We went to San Francisco, and before long the trio fell apart, but Tom Maston and I continued on as a duo. And we went to Hollywood specifically to check out the Randy Sparks organization. Randy had the New Christie Minstrels and the Back Porch Majority, two large folk groups at the time. John Denver was in one of them early in his career. A guy named Barry Friedman worked for Randy Sparks and we became his project. He took us into the studio with some really good musicians and we recorded a three song demo that landed us a deal with uh, Columbia Records. And they wanted us to, they wanted to release one of the songs as a single and they wanted us to keep writing and, and eventually record an album. We were living in a house on Fountain Avenue in Hollywood, right next door to Barry Friedman's house. Barry's place was just a constant flow of artists coming and going, mostly musicians. Jamming over there and overflowing into our house. Uh, Tom Mastin's my house. Everybody trading songs and stuff. People would crash at our place, crash next door. We were auditioning, <clears throat> excuse me, we were auditioning musicians for our band. Our drummer ended up being Billy Mundy, who went on to be with the, the Mothers of Invention. And our drummer was Jim Fielder, who went on to be with Blood, Sweat, and Tears. It was a very musical community. I mean, just a couple of blocks worth of houses. A lot of people there. Ruth Ann Friedman, who wrote Wendy, lived right down the street. My brother Keith and I are the first people to hear the song Wendy when Ruth Ann came by and played it for us the, the day after she had written it. Some of the guys in the association hung out at my house, and of course they had a big hit with it. In fact, they invited me to join the association, and had I done so, I would have been the guy singing Cherish. But I had to decide whether to join the association or team up with Tom Shipley, and I'm, I'm glad I made the, the choice I did. Um, Fountain Avenue was being widened at the time, and there, every night there'd be a large vehicle parked in front of my house with a big roller on the front of it for smashing down hot, the hot asphalt. There was this one band in particular uh, crashing next door and rehearsing. Uh, and one night, Barry Friedman and Neil Young came into my house and said, hey, Mike, look what we just stole off that thing in front of your house. We're going to name the band this. And they held up a big iron plaque that said Buffalo Springfield. Uh, outside of the band, I may very well be the first person to hear for what it's worth when, when Steve played it for me in my living room on my, my D18 before they'd even recorded it. Well, Buffalo Springfield and Mastin and the Brewer Band, the first shows we did was about a half a dozen shows, I think, in Southern California opening for the Birds. Eight Miles High was their, their current single. And we were going over really well. And, and in fact, in no time, our two bands were arguably a couple of the bands to watch in, in LA at the time. So much so that uh, we were booked Co-Bill for a solid week into the Whiskey A Go-Go. <clears throat> Tom Maston said he uh, had met some girl he wanted to move in with her and he asked if I would take his amp to the gig, which I did. Long story short, he never showed up. <laughs> a couple of days later, a friend said they'd seen him in San Francisco, so at least I knew in which direction he'd headed. I didn't see him again for many years. And then uh, many years after that, sadly, he committed suicide. The guy had issues. Well, about this time, my brother Keith came to L.A. And uh, we took him into the studio. He re-recorded Tom Maston's vocals. And Columbia went ahead and released it as Brewer and Brewer. And it was the, it was the end of that. <clears throat> my guy at Columbia Records was getting ready to move to work for another, a new label being formed by Herb Alpert and Jerry Moss called A&M Records. And uh, my guy took me along with him and signed me as a staff songwriter for one of their publishing companies. And I got uh, some cuts on some of my songs. In fact, uh, the Nitty Gritty Dirt Band's second single after Buy From Me The Rain was a song of mine called Truly Right. Ended up on Brewer and Shipley's first album. Um, about that time, Tom Shipley came to LA. He moved into a house right around the corner from me next door to Jim Messina, who was a, a recording engineer at the time. And uh, we, we knew each other, you know, from the folk circus. So we did some hanging out and some picking and started writing some songs. 
And uh, pretty soon he got signed as a staff songwriter for A&M also. And we'd go into recording studios and record demos on our songs for the label to pitch to artists. And we got cuts, you know, various people recorded some of our songs. But it didn't take long to realize that, that we kind of had our own thing happening. And we'd also, that's when they said, you know, well, why don't you guys record your own song? So that's how our first album came about on A&M Records entitled Down in L.A. We recorded half of it at Leon Russell's home studio. Leon played all the keyboard on it. Everybody else on the album were uh, guys known as the Wrecking Crew. They were on everybody's records in the 60s and 70s. In fact, there's a, there's a documentary out now called The Wrecking Crew. If you haven't seen it, check it out. It's really good. We'd started getting on stage, too, you know, singing our, our few songs that we had when we could, places like the Troubadour, the Ice House. On Monday nights at the Troub, uh, it was called Hootenanny Night. You'd pay your dollar, and if you got to play, you got your dollar back. And people, <laughs> people standing in line waiting to, to hopefully get to play would be early in their careers, people like Linda Ronstadt, uh, Arlo Guthrie, uh, a 17-year-old Jackson Brown, you know, people who would go on to be the Eagles and Poco and just whoever, you know. Mike Nesmith was the light man at the Ice House at the time, right before, right before the monkeys. Um, there was a club in Kansas City called the Vanguard Coffee House that Tom and I both had played as solos. Before we left LA, we flew back one time and played the Vanguard over Christmas and New Year's. And our opening act was another guy who flew in from LA. He was working at Disneyland at the time calling himself a banjo magic act, Steve Martin. And boy, have I got some side stories to tell about those two weeks, but I only have a limited amount of time. I'll try to squeeze in as many back stories and side stories as possible, though. But uh, anyway, we finished down in LA. By the way, Tom Shipley and I, for a couple of folkies, we've actually uh, been on the cutting edge of technology, believe it or not, a few times in our lives. One of them was our Down in LA album. Strangely enough, it bored as this put things in perspective. Down in LA was one of the very first stereophonic sound albums ever released. How bizarre is that, you know? Uh, John Denver told me one time years ago that uh, he used to use our album to demonstrate stereo to people. They'd sit around, you know, and pass a bowl and put on headphones, because we really made, utilize it, we made stuff go back and forth and everything, so it was pretty cool <laughs> listening, listening to it uh, with headphones on. About three years ago, a label in the UK got the rights to it and re-released it finally on CD. And it comes with uh, a 12-page pamphlet telling all about the recording of it and pictures of the musicians and everything. And uh, I got to say, it holds up pretty good. It was, it's, very, it's very 60s, but uh, it holds up pretty well. Well, Tom and I, we were just getting burnt out living in LA. I mean, the last summer we lived there, the smog was so bad you couldn't breathe. and. That was the summer the whole Charlie Manson thing had gone down and the, the LAPD were just stormtroopers. You couldn't go to the grocery store if you looked like we did without being hassled. Uh, I saw Charlie Manson on the A&M lot one day, actually. He was a, a frustrated songwriter. He was trying to get a guy named, uh, uh, oh gosh, it just went out of my head right then. Terry Melcher. Terry Melcher, thank you very much. <laughs> Terry Melcher, Doris Day's son, actually, worked at A&M and he was trying to get Terry to publish some of his songs. And what a lot of people don't know is the house that Sharon Tate and all those people were murdered in was actually Terry's house. So I think he might have been after Terry Melcher and his, his people. Anyway, we were, we were fed up out there. We, we thought there had to be a better way to make music and hopefully earn a living at it without living there. But in those days, if you didn't live in LA or San Francisco, New York or Nashville, they didn't consider you really being in the business. So we did it the hard way, we left. And uh, a and thought we'd just quit the business and gone home, so it made it pretty easy for us to get out of our contracts. Uh, we had made a lot of friends in Kansas City associated with the Vanguard, and they felt the same way we did about things. And they wanted to form a company, but they needed somebody with a record. Well, we just happened to have a brand new album, so we moved to Kansas City, and with some friends formed Good Karma Productions. Six, 1968, Good Karma <laughs> Productions. <laughs> And we bought a station wagon and a PA system, and we traveled all over the heartland, playing virtually every college that existed at the time, building the following. And we went to the East Coast for our next record deal. We got signed to Buddha Kama Sutra Records. 
A man named Neil Bogart was the CEO, and he was known as the Bubblegum King with hits like Yummy, 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 I Got Love in My Tummy, if you remember that song. But he wanted to change that image, and uh, FM radio was brand new. It's called Underground Radio. And it was all about album artists. It didn't have anything to do with singles. You, know, you heard music that you normally would never get to hear. And that's what he wanted, you know, so he signed us. We went back to San Francisco to record an album called Weeds. And uh, it was produced by a man named Nick Gravenitis. Nick was a singer, uh, guitar player, blues player from Chicago in the Electric Flag. And a bunch of the guys from the Electric Flag were living in San Francisco then. Uh, along with uh, former members of the Paul Butterfield Blues Band, Mike Bloomfield, Mark Naftalin. So here we are, a couple of folkies, working with a bunch of Chicago bluesers, and somehow we m created some sort of hybrid folk rock, I don't even know what you'd call it, sound with our Weeds album. Uh, but everybody liked it. We got a whole lot of FM airplay, made a lot of fans. We started uh, touring, playing larger venues, opening for name artists. Uh, once again, we're you know just a couple of guys with acoustic guitars, but there was something about us that people liked. We were pretty strong. <clears throat> we, in fact, we were going over better than the, some of the people we were opening for. We were on tour with America. Horse with No Name was their current single. But we were copping all the reviews. So what did America do? They fired us from the tour. <laughs> well, we still uh, had plenty of other shows, you know, playing with other people and playing the Vanguard. and. And flying back and forth to San Francisco, we had begun work on our next LP, which would be entitled Tarkio. Well, one night at the Vanguard, we were getting ready to go on for our last set, and a friend came by with some really good hash. And we stepped out back for a minute, and we came back in and getting tuning up, and Tom went, Whew, man, I'm one toke over the line. I just cracked up. I thought it was hysterical. Right off the top of my head, I started singing, one toke over the line, sitting downtown in a railway station. So the next day, we put it together, turn it into a song, literally just entertaining ourselves. We didn't take it seriously at all. We were just writing something to make our friends laugh. That's what, how we viewed it. Well, the first time we played Carnegie Hall, we opened for Melanie. And uh, we got several encores, went over really well, and basically ran out of songs. So we said, well, let's do one toke, and we did. And everybody liked it, and Neil Bogart was there. He came backstage, and, and he said, oh, you gotta record that. You gotta add that to the LP. And, which kind of surprised us, really, because we didn't take the song seriously. But we did. We recorded it and handed in the LP. And next thing we know, they decided to release it as a single. And it went shooting up the charts. And we were in big trouble <laughs> with the United States government, as a matter of fact. It was the Nixon administration. And this is when uh, they were having the FCC uh, threaten radio stations with their licenses if they didn't censor so-called drug lyrics in rock and roll, which we thought was the equivalent of burning books. It was ridiculous. Puff the Magic Dragon was on that list, for God's sake. And I know for a fact that it didn't have anything to do with weed. But anyway, uh, the Vice President of the United States named us personally on national TV one night as subversives to American youth. Well, you can't buy that kind of publicity, you know? <laughs> You can't buy that kind of stuff. And we made Nixon's enemies list, which we held as a badge of honor, and still do to this very day. Well, to show you, you know, how ridiculous it really was, at the same time Nixon's trying to ban our song, Lawrence Welk performed one toke over the line. It's on YouTube. You can check it out if you haven't seen it. It's hysterical. It's called Token with Lawrence Welk. But uh, Jerry Garcia and the Grateful Dead started performing One Took Over the Line. So Tom and I figure we've got to be the only two songwriters on the planet to ever write a song performed both by Lawrence Welk and Jerry Garcia. We've got to be. It's got to be. Well, thanks to a lot of uh, very brave uh, radio station heads who decided to play it anyway, and a lot of folks who really wanted to hear it anyway, uh, it went on to be a, a big hit for us. And who would have guessed that all these decades later, that silly little song we didn't take seriously, is still played all over the world, and it's in movies and on TV and in books. And in fact, uh, the, the phrase itself has become part of the vernacular. For instance, uh, not long ago when the new pope was getting ready to move into the Vatican, but the old pope was going to remain there as well, Stephen Colbert did a, a thing one night. He said, folks, for the first time in 700 years, 
we're going to have two popes in the Vatican. Does that mean we're one pope over the line, sweet Jesus? One pope <laughs> over the line? So who would have guessed? Who would have guessed? But we like money in the mail, so we're, we're happy that people like the song. We'll go to our graves. It'll live on longer than we will, no doubt. Well, we went on to record, uh, I think, three more albums for Buddha Kama Sutra and then two albums for Capital. And by about 1980, we were toast. We were just fried. We'd been living on the road for a very, very long time. After one toke, I mean, we'd been on the road forever anyway, the, from the folk days, and then left LA, and we were on the road all the time, just trying to pay the bills. But after one toke, we just kept being on the road. We just started playing larger venues and getting paid a lot more. But um, by 1980, we were just really fried. We were ready for a break, and, and Tom was wanting, interested in getting into things outside of music even, which he did. And I moved back to Oklahoma to raise kids. And one night, doing a solo show in Colorado, I met Dan Fogelberg, and he was working on his Innocent Age album at the time. He invited me to sing a duet with him on a song called The Reach, which I did. And uh, next thing I know, he decided he wanted to produce me. So I was just talking to Michael Cochran about that. He ended up producing my first solo LP for Warner Brothers entitled Beauty Lies. And uh, just about the time it was to be released, all of a sudden hundreds of radio stations across the country stopped playing that kind of music, including Dan Fogelberg. And their logo became, we are now playing what you see on MTV. So times, the times they were changing one more time as they as are apt to do. So it just kind of, if it hadn't been for Irving Azoff, who was arguably the most powerful man in the music business at the time, my album and some Joe Walsh album would, wouldn't even have ever been released. But Michael Cochran has a copy of it. He told me a while ago. <laughs> and uh, you can find it on eBay once in a while or something like that, a used record store. Uh, about that time, I got a call from a, a, a classic rock radio station in Kansas City, the Fox. They'd been there for a year, and they were number one in the ratings. And uh, they wanted to have a big celebration to celebrate their birthday, and they asked if we would consider reuniting <clears throat> for a concert at the Starlight Theater. And we said, sure, we'd be happy to. Other friends were invited to be part of the show, like our friends Ozark Mountain Daredevils, Randy Channing right there, original member, and uh, it was really fun. I'd, I'd like to take this opportunity to, to point something out that, that we've never gotten any credit for. Tom and I have got, haven't gotten credit for a lot of things in our long career, but uh, other people ended up cr taking credit for this, but we actually had, we were quite instrumental in helping the Dares get started in the business. We came down, there was a tape of theirs going around Kansas City, 20-something songs, and we were I finally got my turn to listen to it, and I was just blown away by their songs and their personalities. And uh, we wanted to record a song written by Steve Cash called Black Sky, which we did on one of our albums. So we made it a point to come down and meet them. They were hanging out at a place in Bolivar called Rudy Valley Ranch, and we spent the weekend with them and invited them to go out on the road with us, which they did, and become part of Good Karma Productions, which they did. And they got a record deal with A&M Records, what goes around comes around. So uh, it's been a long, strange trip too, hasn't it, Randy? <laughs> but anyway, we did, uh, after that, we did some more shows and we were enjoying performing again. But what really got us back together was we started writing again. That's what got us together in the first place. And between the two of us, Tom and I had recorded for four or five record labels. And frankly, we'd been screwed by every one of them. So we decided to form our own company and screw ourselves. <laughs> Uh, so far, so good, by the way. <laughs> kind of on a par, you know. So we have two independent CDs. One is entitled Shanghai, recorded right here in Springfield at Lou Whitney's old studio. In fact, Lou has co-producer credits on that. Uh, Lloyd Hicks is playing drums. Donnie Thompson's on guitar. Randy's playing some mandolin on it. And we have one entitled Heartland. I was talking about how we've, some, uh, we've, we've had some cutting edge technology experiences starting with our first album down in LA being the first one of the first stereo uh, LPs when we were working on our weeds album our second album in San Francisco it had gone from four track to eight track and the first 16 track board to come into the state of California came into San Francisco and we finished our weeds album on that and it's a hysterical thing you know that 
it was so difficult just trying to transfer everything over to 16 tracks. Oh, wow, 16 tracks, what are we going to do with all the... And uh, when it came time to mix, it was hands-on, everybody, you know, just flipping switches and doing stuff. And then uh, later on, one of our Capitol albums, we mixed in a place called Westlake Audio. It was just a showcase room in Hollywood of the first 48-track uh, digital computer board. And that was quite an undertaking. We didn't know if it would even work. We had to bring in two 24-track machines and sync, try to sync them up. We'd have to count down three, two, one, and two different people punch the go button at the same time and hope that they played in sync. And sometimes the magic worked and sometimes it didn't. But if it didn't work, you knew right away because the speakers almost came flying off the wall. But we mixed our, uh, our one of the Capitol albums. It was called ST11261. Uh, on that, that was pretty cutting edge technology at the time. The reason we named that album that, by the way, was people in the record industry don't even refer to your music as music, it's just product to them. It's not even product now, it's called files today. Uh, well, we thought, okay, they want product, we'll give them product. We decided to look ahead and see what the product manufacturing serial number would be on our upcoming album, and it happened to be ST11261, so that's why we named it that. And everybody at Capitol Records from the ninth floor up were, was thrilled. They, they just loved it. So anyway, we, we recorded that, and we recorded, uh, I mean, we recorded Shanghai here in Springfield, and then we did Heartland. Tom had gotten into uh, videography work, and for a long time, uh, he made these cool little documentaries about the Ozarks, and sometimes we'd, he'd use our songs for them. And, but then he, got, he started working at the University of Missouri Science and Technology in Rolla. And uh, they were always sent into places like Bolivia and the Amazon and shooting videos for the university. So his home recording equipment was not for CDs. It was strictly for TV work. In fact, we couldn't even record a vocal or a guitar at his house. And he had, but he had all this sample sound computer stuff that we'd never played with before. So we had to think way ahead with every song. Uh, once again, here we are, a couple of folkies, guitar acoustic guys. We had to think ahead and play all the instruments ourselves on computer, bass, drums, flute, whatever, whatever we decided. And then and once we thought we had everything we wanted, then we had to take it to a TV station in St. Louis and transfer that to a, a different format, not even know if it was gonna work, fortunately it did. And then we had to take it to a studio in Springfield to transfer that to it yet another format to take into a recording studio, which happened to be Nick Sibley's studio, to actually overdub Brewer and Shipley. <laughs> Acoustic guitars, vocals, fiddle, mandolin, you know, whatever, actual instruments, and hope that it worked. And somehow, it turned out pretty good. People seemed to like it. I don't have copies today, but you can find both of those CDs on uh, Amazon, I think, iTunes. And I have three solo CDs. I brought some today. Retro Man uh, was my first one. It's, uh, I still call myself a folk singer. And folk music, folk music has traditionally been about social commentary. And Brewer and Shipley have always had a lot of social commentary. We came from the folk era, whatever. And uh, in fact, Nina Simone was quoted as saying not long ago that it, she thinks it's an artist's duty to uh, reflect the times in which they live. And I go along with that. Well, my Retro Man CD, basically every song on it was inspired by the Bush administration, to be honest with you. It's me shaking my fist, ranting and raving. And uh, It Is What It Is is another one, and it is what it is. It's just me with a guitar live in the studio. And then last but not least, uh, a CD entitled Dancing With My Shadow. And I still, I'm more prolific as a writer today than ever, don't ask me why. And my, my way of writing has completely changed for years and years. It would just you know, be jamming on my guitar or something, you know, come up with some chord changes. And now then, I, something just pops into my head, and I write entire songs in my head. I even hear them produced. And uh, so I have plans to record another solo here in Springfield. And my take on it is, if, if I don't record them, then why write them? Because it's, it's far too zen you know, for nobody to ever hear them but me, just in, in my head. So I plan to record another one. And if anybody's interested, there's, there's some here to check out today. Uh, did you bring any Wes Wilson posters? No. Oh, okay. Anyway, um, Tom and I are still doing shows. We don't tour like we used to, because we're old and, old and beat up. Oh, okay. 
Yeah, we're old and beat up, so we don't do uh, don't do long tours anymore. We, we there's one tour we have done though that used to be all over. Well, it still is. The promoters have done it for about 28 years now. It's all over the Dakotas and Wyoming and Montana, and it ends with five shows in Alaska. <clears throat> and we've done that about a half a dozen times. And frankly, it's places nobody else will play. <laughs> it's really it's the boondocks, and they're so close together. There's no airports either. You have to drive, and some of those drives are hellacious. And we just didn't want to do that one again. So we are doing the Alaska part, though. We're going to do four or five shows in Alaska in May. And we still go out. We do shows and still enjoy it as long as our, our fans still come to see us. And, and uh, like our music, I think our fans are very forgiving. Uh, I think a lot of it's nostalgia. You know, people hear those songs and takes them back to their college days and, and so forth and so on. I, we'd love to play Springfield. We haven't played Springfield in a long time. Yeah. I don't know why our friends, the Ozark Mountain Daredevils, don't ever invite us to join the stage with them when they play the damn Gilloys. But anyway, I'm just giving them, busting their balls. Uh, I guess that's it. It kind of brings it up to date. And now today, here I am speaking to you people, and it's been a pleasure. I guess I'm supposed to take uh, questions if anybody has any. Sure. Yes, Tom uh, got seriously injured in a car wreck several years ago. Two, two teenagers, uh, one of them were, was killed, and uh, the other one lost a leg. They were wearing seat belts. And Tom, it was, as he put it, was license plate to license plate at about 50 miles an hour on the Ozark Mountain Road. And uh, actually what did more damage to him than anything was the airbag going off and hitting him in the chest. And uh, he's still having problems, you know, from, from that little tiny cracks in his teeth even from just gritting his teeth, you know, that kind of thing. But he's still kicking. He'll be 75 years old April 1st. I'll be 72 April 14th. Any other questions? Yes. Yeah, your knowledge, did anybody ever flew in wealthy people that one told them not a gospel song? <laughs> I know some of the guys in uh, the uh, Lennon Brothers. I live outside of Branson. And uh, they grew up on the set, you know, because they're, they're parents, the Lennon sisters. And I asked one of them one time, I said, did anybody have a clue about one toke over the line? He says, oh, I guarantee you some of the guys in the band did. But uh, Lawrence, Lawrence didn't know. And Dale and Gail, who sang it, they didn't know either. Yes, anybody else? When did you, when did you record your last album? I know it's your neck and Cash and Lloyd are on Yeah, that. Steve Cash is on that, Bobby Lloyd. And Barry. Uh, it came out... Uh, my lovely wife Scarlett and I lost our home in the so-called Branson tornado in 2012. And it was the end of the world for us. We were home too, we were lucky to be breathing because she woke up about one o'clock in the morning to extreme lightning and got up to turn off the computer and then turn on the TV just in time to hear him say, take cover, if you're Michael and Scarlett, take cover now. <laughs> and uh, she ran down and woke me up and she didn't quite make it to our bathroom and something knocked her down. And out of a sound sleep, I made it about six feet, and the ceiling caved in on me while I was trying to get to the bathroom. And I just had to get on top of her, hold her down, keep, try to keep from just getting sucked up into space as the ceilings flew and everything just sitting. And that came out uh, about two weeks after the tornado. In fact, we were in a motel in Forsyth at the time, and uh, I got a, those showed up in the mail, and I went out to the car and put it in to listen to it one night. Uh, the first song is called Crazy Rain, which actually was uh, inspired by not only Joplin, which was a year earlier, but when we were, all of us were getting ridiculous amounts of rain at that time. We live uh, above Lake Tanicomo at the, at the tailwaters by Powerside Dam, and there was no Powerside Dam. There was so much rain, it was just level water and boats and everything were just floating on downstream. And that's when I wrote the song Crazy Rain. But the second verse in that, was a little lot hard to listen to for quite a while because he was talking about tornadoes and stuff. So it's been out, uh, what, three years, I guess. Yeah. Yes? How'd you end up in Branson? Divorce. <laughs> I, yeah, moving back to Oklahoma didn't, didn't fly very well. <laughs> so yeah, I, I didn't even know where I was going. Actually, I, was, uh, I, I wasn't about to go back to LA. And uh, I had kids that I had to leave in Oklahoma, and I wanted to stay as close as possible to them. Plus, this is about the time that Tom Shipley and I were getting back together after a long break. And uh, I was sort of on my way to Nashville, I guess. 
but there was a guy named Bob Millsap li living in, in Branson at the time, he had a recording studio, and he was a Nashville publisher, and he was interested in some of my stuff, so I, basically a friend uh, brought me to the area, and I was just kind of passing through, but I liked it, and this is way before Branson turned into the world's largest roadside oddity. <laughs> and uh, you could, I liked it. It was like Mayberry, you know. You could go trout fishing downtown while I did my laundry. I thought, this is, this is pretty cool. <laughs> so, uh, and then I met Scarlett and made friends and just uh, never left. Can't get rid of me now. <laughs> Anybody else? Any questions? Yes. Uh, yes, they've all been, well, not really, my brother Keith did, as I said, he came to L.A., and uh, poor guy, was, it was, he was overwhelmed because he came straight from Oklahoma City and goes straight into a recording studio and signs a record deal, and it's, it's kind of overwhelming to him, and uh, he's done a lot of shows with me and with Tom Shipley over the years. He co-wrote one of the songs on our first album down in L.A. In fact, for years, Tom and I were just getting uh, paid a salary and of course, a &M owned the publishing and everything, but Keith wasn't signed to him, so he actually got royalties over the years, and uh, it got smaller and smaller, his royalties got smaller and smaller until one time they sent him stamps. <laughs> 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 yeah, pretty funny. Showbiz! <laughs> but they're all musical. In fact, uh, they just, they came for a visit. They came from Oklahoma City this past weekend, and. Uh, my sister was sitting down on the deck with my guitar, playing some songs, and just musical family. Nobody started doing it, you know, thinking they were going to be in the business. It just came naturally, you know. It was just all just born, had musical talent, you know. Our mother always said that we were all hearing music long before we were born anyway. When she's nine months pregnant, her stomach's touching the keyboard or the piano, you know. So we just came by it naturally. Yes? You mean uh, musicians or musicians? Well, let's see. Hmm. Back in the Fountain Avenue days in Hollywood, all the guys in Buffalo Springfield were really nice, really nice guys. But I, I don't know if it's fame or, or too much cocaine or what, but uh, people change. Uh, running into Neil Young a few times over the years, he's always remained exactly the same. I've ever had other people say that he's hard to get along with, but I've never had any problem. He's always been very friendly. Stephen Stills, on the other hand, when I run into him, I'm either his long lost pal or he doesn't know who I am. <laughs> so it's kind of up for grabs. Um, a lot of great people. Dan Fogelberg was a great guy, rest his soul, died way too young. Lost way too many friends just recently. Glenn Fry, of course, Paul Kentner. And uh, like Michael was saying, we got to get used to it. I, I ain't used to it. <laughs> tick tock, tick tock. Anybody else? Any questions? Yeah. Well, Tom and I had produced a couple of our own albums way back with Buddha Kama Sutra. So we well, produced you guys, yeah. But, but I learned a lot. I'm sorry? I always heard that you learned a lot from Dan. I learned a whole lot from Dan, yeah. Dan was, uh, I was a fan of his before I met him, but he was way more talented in many ways than I, than I realized until I worked with him. He was a multi-instrumentalist and just really a very, very, very talented guy, yeah. For what? Similar, similar stuff. Uh, <laughs> Bogart. Bogart. Oh, oh, yeah, I see. <laughs> no, I don't think so. We used to give him a hard time about that, though. And Neil went on to, uh, to even bigger and better things. He, he formed Casablanca Records, too, out in L.A. He was a good guy. He died way too young, also. I really like working for Stan. Mmm, loaded question. <laughs> uh, Stan, early on, was a great guy. He... he Stan Pless was a guy who oper owned and operated the Vanguard ca Coffee House in Kansas City. And like I said, I played there. It's, it's one of the very first traveling gigs I ever did after I left Oklahoma at 19 years old, playing the folk circuit. And uh, it was always a pleasure playing the Vanguard. And he was a good guy. And uh, later on, you know, Good Karma Productions, uh, well, when you start making money, sometimes people change. And that's when that's when Stan started changing to me. 
but you know it's not good to speak ill of the dead, so I won't. Uh, so I won't. <laughs> Anybody else? Your most fun gig. Most fun gig. Boy, that's apples and oranges. We've had uh, had a lot of them. Oh well, yeah, one of them was opening for Elton John on the 50-yard line at Arrowhead Stadium. That was that was pretty cool. And uh, I can't say it, it was fun, but we did 28 cities and 28 nights opening for Jethro Tull. That was that was a very interesting tour, to say the least. Lots of side stories on that one that that I can't tell. I've heard them all. <laughs> well, maybe. Um, one of the the playing Carnegie Hall was pretty special. Played there a couple of times. Um, one of our favorite shows, just a few years ago, actually, longtime friend uh, LeVon Helm, rest his soul. Uh, does everybody know about his Midnight Rambles that he has at his home studio in Woodstock? Uh, those shows once, once a month or something like that, and uh, he and his band play, and they invite people to come in and, and do a set as well. And Tom and I were invited a few years ago to, to be part of that. And that was absolutely one of the best gigs. We ranked that right up there with Carnegie Hall or Arrowhead Stadium or any, any place because it was just so cool. It was so close, up front and intimate. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm sitting like this far away from Levon's back, you know, on the drums. And what a band. I mean, some of the guys from the Tonight Show band showed up and were jamming with him. And uh, Conan O'Brien, players from his band were there, just some of the best East Coast musicians you could possibly play with. And uh, when, for the encore, we were invited up and got to sing The Weight with them. So that was, that was very, very cool. And funny story with that, though, when it was all over, went outside to, people were going outside to leave, and there's a tornado, just horrible storm raging. Just raging, crazy. Turns out that Levon's place was the only house on I don't know, a couple of miles that even had electricity somehow. And everything was dark and the wind is howling and, and uh, most people only knew one way in to his house from uh, wherever that is and was in the woods. So some of the employees were having to lead people, caravanning people out in a road that didn't have fallen trees and, and so forth. And uh, we were looking at the TV at, at downstairs at Levon's house and the White Plains Airport was on the news, it was just being blown away, they didn't have any electricity, well that was the airport we were flying out of the next morning. So we were up all night long trying to find out if, you know, if there was gonna be a flight or anything, of course the lines were all busy. So we just went ahead and drove into White Plains and when we got there, the place was dark, it was very early in the morning, but there was one little light down at the end of the hall, there was a long cable from a generator that had a light going, there was one airline open and uh, some very friendly people helped us figure out how to get home. Uh, later in the day, there weren't any flights uh, going out, but one flight came in going back to Detroit, and they, they figured they could get us to Detroit, but from Detroit back to Missouri, it was up for grabs, but at least we knew other, either that or we were gonna have to go into New York to the city and wait three days to fly out of LaGuardia, so we thought we'd take our chance that we'd rather have to spend the night in Detroit than, uh, than not by LaGuardia. <laughs> so we flew to Detroit, and long story short, we managed to catch a flight home, but by the time I got home, I think I'd been awake at least 36 hours. But while I had all that time to kill, I wrote a real pretty song <laughs> called uh, something, uh, A Warmer Wind. Yeah, that's what it was. And uh, maybe I'll record that one someday. As I said, I'm, I'm more prolific now than, than ever. It's hard to decide what songs to record. And right now I've got it narrowed down to about 14, I think, that I want to record for, the, for my new one. And it may be called, I may entitle it After the Storm. I don't know, I haven't decided yet. Any more questions? Yes. Do you remember playing at the Lander Theater in 76 and the uh, radio station across the street kept feeding through your speaker I do, and I remember you being there too, as a matter of fact. I think it was you, man. I think you were the one. To, I do remember that, yeah, and your question, sir. Tom lives outside of Rolla. He's been there. We left uh, Kansas City in 1975. Uh, we were kind of like hometown heroes. In fact, we lived in Raytown, which is like a suburb of Kansas City, and for the past two years, we've, uh, we've done a show, a big free concert in the park in Raytown, and the mayor 
uh, introduced us and uh, awarded us with a big certificate and proclaimed it Brewer and Shipley Day in, in Raytown for the past couple of years. But anyway, we, we lived in Raytown and we, a little place we didn't name Happy Acres, like a rest home, because we were on the road all the time. When we got home, it was just kind of like a rest home to us. A little place out in the country with a, Tom's lived on one side of the pond and I lived on the other. And we shared a mailbox. Had a mailbox on a big tree stump, probably this big around. And uh, when somebody not only stole our mailbox, but ripped the whole tree stump out of the ground, we thought, okay, it's time to get out of here. So that's when we, uh, we started looking farther south to the Ozarks and bought property, moved down here. Tom originally lived in Newburgh, which is a little teeny town outside of Rolla, and, and he's now south of Rolla, about six miles. And I live about uh, eight or nine miles from Branson, as I said earlier, on uh, right above Lake Tanicombo. And we have a brand new home, by the way. It's beautiful. Y'all come see us sometime. Any other questions? Okay. Guess that's it. Thank you very much.